2024 is here and so is a campaign year unlike any other. Right now, like it or not, it looks like we're headed to a rematch of 2020. President Biden squaring off against former President Trump. Trump is facing an unprecedented 91 criminal charges, but he is still the clear GOP frontrunner. Now, this is Talking Points on CBS News Minnesota. Good evening and welcome to Talking Points. We are just days away from the Iowa caucuses on January 15th and less than two weeks away from the New Hampshire primary on January 23rd. In Iowa, former President Donald Trump holds a commanding lead. An average of all recent polls has him ahead by 36 points. But changes are already rocking the GOP lineup. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie has just dropped out of the race. This comes just as new polls show former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley making a major move in New Hampshire. This New Hampshire poll shows Haley with 32 percent support, just seven points behind Trump's 39 percent. And look at Christie's support. Just before he dropped out, this poll had him at 12 percent in New Hampshire. Where will his supporters go? Surveys show as many as two thirds could go to Nikki Haley. There are, of course, other developments. Frontrunner Donald Trump has been spending a lot of time in court recently. So far, though, all his legal cases only seem to have solidified his support. But will that continue? Let's start with Professor Larry Jacobs of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Joining us right now, Professor Larry Jacobs of the Humphrey School. Thank you so much for your time. Good to be with you. All right. The campaign season is up and running. What are you seeing? What should people be looking at right now? Well, Donald Trump has got a huge, unprecedented, more than 30 point lead in Iowa. Um, and he is pushing hard for his supporters to come out and basically blow the field away. Um, key thing to remember in Iowa is you have to show up to cast your ballot. You've got to sit through basically a pretty long meeting, an hour, could be more than an hour. Um, so you never know exactly you know, what that uh, number is gonna be, but almost certainly Donald Trump will win. He'll probably win double digits. All right, and you know, it's interesting you're talking about showing up. The weather is actually supposed to be pretty bad in Iowa. And that, that's the thing about these caucuses is you have to, as you said, physically have to be there at that time, at that place. Um, as we look ahead, though, things seem to be changing pretty rapidly in New Hampshire and then going forward. What is going on and, and how big a deal is it? New Hampshire is the starting gun, but what happens there will send a signal to the other uh, states where you're going to now have primaries. Um, if Donald Trump doesn't win by more than 30 points, it's going to start to generate questions about whether his support is actually soft or strong. Moving into New Hampshire, we are seeing Nikki Haley absolutely in a rocket ship of support. She's up, you know, large double digits in just a month. Um, now, can Nikki Haley beat Donald Trump? Maybe in New Hampshire, but even if it's close, it's going to send a strong signal that Donald Trump's support is soft, that he's vulnerable, and he can be beat. And it, it, it is an expectations game. It's not just, uh, it's, you know, we're expecting a, a blowout from President Trump, former President Trump in both Iowa and New Hampshire. And if that doesn't happen, then that's what people look at. So it's, it's a little odd thing. Expectations is the name of the game in Iowa. Will Donald Trump meet or even exceed the 30 point lead he has in the polls or come up short? If he's short, even by a little bit, it's going to give momentum uh, to Nikki Haley moving into New Hampshire, where she is surging um, and could possibly overtake Donald Trump, which would be a stunning win for her and reset the battle for the Republican uh, presidential nomination. On the Democratic side, we are seeing President Joe Biden come out with ferocious attacks on President Trump, something he's never done. In the past, he's never even mentioned former President Trump's name. Uh, this is different. Is this something that he needs to do? Joe Biden is in a weak political position. His approval ratings are weak on every dimension. Uh, and he is seeing key groups of supporters, the young, uh, voters of color, um, women, all sagging 
So he's looking for a way to energize his base of support. Attacking Donald Trump has been the recipe for Joe Biden and Democrats, along with going after hot issues like abortion. From a political science perspective, how un unusual is this, our whole situation with the former president challenging the current president, and then also very much, not in the background, but in the foreground, all these legal questions and, and problems that, that former President Trump has to deal with. We have never had a presidential race like 2024, where one of the main candidates is literally in court facing 91 charges. We're now starting to see Donald Trump's opponents using that, talking about his vulnerability and the fact that he will now be dogged uh, you know, through the Democratic primaries, but then into the general election. Does that make him weaker? Nikki Haley argues that she actually is stronger against Joe Biden because she doesn't have these legal questions and possible convictions. Polls have showed that Donald Trump's support will drop by about five to 10 points uh, if he is convicted. Can that happen? Yeah, that is possible. Right. But since the indictments, all the indictments, he's only gained strength, which is just such a conundrum. I mean, a lot of people are just wondering what's going on. And I guess that's why they got to pay attention and watch. Yes, we're, we're going to have to keep a close eye on this uh, battle for the Republican nomination. When Donald Trump was indicted starting in the summer, his support went up, but it was up among Republicans, particularly Republicans who are going to be voting in the primaries and turning out for the caucuses. In the general public, it's not helped him. In fact, some polls show that among within, voters- within, with independence, It's independence and it's among those who have not made up their minds, They're the swing voters. Okay. And among those haven't decided voters, uh, a conviction by of Donald Trump matters. Um, and so we've got basically two elections going on. Uh, the uh, legal troubles Donald Trump has faced has helped him uh, build this huge lead among Republican primary uh, voters and caucus goers. But what happens in the general election could be very different. And Nikki Haley is now using the possible Donald Trump vulnerability come November against Joe Biden to her advantage. All right, well, Professor Larry Jacobs, thank you so much, we really appreciate it. Good to be with you. Up next, constitutional law professor David Schultz and Republican analyst, Amy Koch. Well, joining us right now is Professor David Schultz, political analyst and also a constitutional law professor. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, Esme. Thanks for having me. Okay, we're trying to get a handle of what is going on right now. Let me ask you, what's going on in the legal world of President Trump? Because there are so many issues that he is involved in. Right. There's two big ones at this point, and they're both headed to the Supreme Court, probably. Uh, the first one is regarding whether or not actions that Donald Trump engaged in while he was president, does he enjoy immunity now He's no now that he's no longer president of the United States? And the reason why that's important is because he faces four criminal trials, 91 indictments stemming from actions that occurred when he was president. If he, if, a, if the courts were to say that he's immune from prosecution, those cases go away. Um, and, and, and that obviously has so a that's big a big impact. deal. <laughs> that's a big, big deal for a lot of people here. Uh, the Court of Appeals heard heard his arguments and was very skeptical. My guess is that the Court of Appeals probably rules against him. Trump appeals it up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which would then mean that'll be two cases that the Supreme Court is going to weigh in on that affect the presidential election. The other one being regarding whether or not states like Colorado have the authority to use the insurrection clause to keep Donald Trump off the ballot. So these, you know, these are big well, cases that are that are coming down the line right now that affect the, the presidential race. OK, pundits on both sides of this political spectrum, very conservative, very liberal, all seem to be saying the same thing. They expect the Supreme Court on the issue of whether Trump should remain on the ballots in states across the country, 
all of them seem to be saying, the ones that I have seen say that they believe the Supreme Court will rule to keep him on the ballot. I think that's absolutely correct. And they're going to keep him on the ballot, but not rule on the merits. And what I mean by that, in Colorado, they said he engaged in insurrection. In, in Maine, the Secretary of State, he engaged in insurrection. The Supreme Court, I think, will overturn the, the, the those decisions, not address whether or not he engaged in insurrection, but argue and say, for example, either the insurrection clause doesn't apply or that that Congress has to act to be able to put the insurrection clause into effect. It'll do something like that, but it'll basically overturn the Colorado decision, say that that this is not a matter for states to decide. Congress is probably needs to weigh in and keep him on the ballot. So far, polls have seemed to indicate that Trump supporters don't care about these particular indictments. In fact, they only seem to have enhanced his standing and his growth in support. Is that going to hold up over the next few weeks, do you think? It might hold up with his hardcore supporters. But remember, at the end of the day, when it gets to the general election, uh, the general election, we're talking about swing voters in a few swing states. This, this, this could have a big impact, a conviction, a conviction for the general election could be enough to move just a few voters to affect the outcome of election. But even here right now, in the, in the middle of the primaries, it's it's potentially could affect him in states like New Hampshire and others going down the line where he's a distracted from full time campaigning or B, um, if you were in the middle of a trial how might that or convicted how might that affect how some of the republican voters view him in in terms of um former president trump going forward are the movement are the change in poll numbers we're seeing in some polls with nikki haley especially in new hampshire is that significant it's potentially significant we need to know a lot more about the polling and who's being you know you know who's being questioned at this point but many people thought that new hampshire was perhaps the best place if you're challenging trump to do so because new hampshire is 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 a little is is way different than than iowa in terms of its politics and new hampshire is a much more as we've seen in the past less supportive of Donald Trump. So this is the window that Nikki Haley needs. Now, whether or not these polls are suggesting a real opening or if she's opened up a lead or if she's really close, we, we just don't know. But but clearly, New Hampshire is, is a state that is going to be incredibly critical in terms of the nomination, because if Trump wins that one going away, it's probably all over. Uh, Professor David Schultz, thank you so much as always. We really appreciate your insights. My pleasure. Thank you, Esme. Joining us right now, Republican strategist Amy Koch. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. What are you watching right now? Things are changing pretty quickly. They are changing quickly. Um, so it's an exciting time, right? This is the Super Bowl for me and my fellow <laughs> political nerds. Uh, so we get very excited. But no, the race is on. So next Monday, the 15th, is the Iowa caucus. Iowa loves to be first, but caucuses are always odd, right? Trump is out in front, not surprising. By, um, by a lot, like 30 plus points. By like 30 plus points. So I, so I don't think anything surprising is going to come out of Iowa. But when it comes to caucuses, when it comes to these primaries, it's all about expectation. So if you're expected to win by a lot or you're expected to win, you need to solidly win. Um, and if and, and then what happens is people watch who's second, who's third, because as people drop out of these primaries, you know, there's a there's a large the, Trump's got a lot of votes, but there's a lot of people in the in yet. And so as people drop out, if they don't go to Trump, right, if they're kind of like, I'm not, I don't think Trump is the best choice, where do they go? And you can have someone that starts to climb. And we are seeing that in New Hampshire. Um, with, or Nikki. with Nikki Haley. Yeah. Um, let me ask you about Iowa, because Nikki Haley actually got in a little bit of trouble with, well, a lot of trouble with Iowa voters when she said in New Hampshire, um, well, you folks here in New Hampshire are going to correct what Iowa does, where, you know, yeah. Trump appears to have a, an insurmountable lead. Is that true? Is Iowa now sort of not as indicative of what the final outcome for the nomination might be on the Republican side? 
It just really hasn't been. The system is a caucus system. You know, we have caucuses here in Minnesota too, but now we've added the primary, which I think is the right move. Caucuses, I always say like democracy shouldn't be so hard that you have to have like a primer for how to do it and ask anybody on the streets how to go to their caucus and what they're supposed to do. And nobody knows. You literally have to do trainings to get people to caucuses. So it's just when you make it that complicated, people want to go, they want to vote. Um, and so, um, so I think, so I think Iowa just becomes, it, you know, their first, it gives us a little peek, but I do think the primary process is more, more indicative of what's going on. And the caucus is to remind everyone, you physically have to be there on Monday night in, right. in person and you have, you have to travel to the caucus site and actually the weather is supposed to be kind of yucky, which also affects people. I mean, think about it, if you've got a, a bunch of kids or if you're older. And four years ago, it was a disaster. Hopefully, Iowa has, has cleaned up their act. But it, yeah. it's even, oh, not what, what people are used to, being able to vote early and when they want. Right. I remember Minnesota caucuses. I was there in 2016 when Trump was on, when Trump was first on the ballot. And we had so many people show up thinking that they were just going to get in line, cast their vote, and go. And there was so much confusion and the lines were so long because of how the process works. Uh, it's just so much better now that we're in a primary and we're on Super Tuesday. So Minnesota is going to be relevant. OK, there's so much going on in the Republican side with former President Trump, including all of these legal issues. What are Republicans really thinking? Is there is are there is there a Republican voice out there that's not being expressed or are some people just not saying out loud what they really think? Or does Trump really have that solid support that he appears to have in all these polls? Well, I think that's going to be tested in New Hampshire and South Carolina and on Super Tuesday. I think we're going to see because there's a huge vocal support for for Donald Trump, right? It's, there's no doubt about it. And you see even in leadership, people don't, they don't speak against him, right? Or they send an endorsement. I still think that if you're a betting person that Trump's, you know, got the inside track on this. But I do see a shift in polls and I do wonder what happens when someone else starts to get momentum and, and a bunch of Republicans go, oh, it's OK. Right. We don't we, Republicans don't want to go and vote for Joe Biden. Republicans don't want to go and vote for a third party. Republicans want to go and vote for a Republican. Um, but we've been having a real divide, not just across the country, but within the Republican Party. So this is going to and, and, you know, largely since sort of like this, the, the chaos, which is Donald Trump's presidency and the aftermath, right? He takes no prisoners. He insults everyone. Um, and it's just, some people like that, but I think a lot of people go, you know, like that, the rhetoric's just, it's just, it's just ugly and we don't need it. it. We can disagree and we don't need to be so ugly. Well, it'll be interesting to see because everybody's watching the GOP uh, this time around. Thank you so much, Amy Cope. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I always love to come on. Thank you. Up next, the Democratic perspective from DFL analyst Abu Amara. Well, joining us right now, political analyst, DFL analyst Abu Amara. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Esme. All right. New year, a lot going on. What are you seeing right now? What's happening that you have your eye on? Yeah, with the turn of the year, it really means campaigns are gearing up and we're focused on actual people showing up to caucuses and actual people voting. And so it's not so much about the polls anymore, what's been what's in our minds or what folks think might happen. It's about what's actually going to happen now. And I'm looking at two big things. One of them is in Iowa, uh, because you're starting to see some consolidation with Donald Trump. And then I'm looking actually past New Hampshire. So I'm looking at South Carolina, looking at Florida and Nevada, Super Tuesday states, because I think that trajectory tells you a lot about what's going to happen in the Republican primary. And what are you seeing there that's jumping out? Uh, what I'm seeing is Nikki Haley surging. There's in, no question. Not, that not so much in Iowa but in New Hampshire and going forward. I mean, it, it looks like she could overtake Trump, which is incredible to say, but it's possible. Well, I think Republicans might think she's the last best hope. Um, Donald Trump is still in a very strong position. He has a solid 51% majority in Iowa based on most recent polling. And in Florida, he's doing particularly well, given the fact that uh, Ron DeSantis, who's the governor of that state, 
is, is somehow losing in his own state. So the question for Nikki Haley is going to be, does she have staying power beyond New Hampshire? New Hampshire has unique rules where actually independents can participate in the Republican Party. And so she's able to build a bigger coalition in New Hampshire. We'll see if that has lasting power beyond New Hampshire. And pay attention to South Carolina. She's the former governor of that state. That's very fertile ground for her. She's able to win in South Carolina. It's conceivable that could give her momentum moving forward. All right. Early voting starts January 19th. What impact do you think it has to start early voting? I mean, do you think people will go to the polls that early? Obviously, it's set up that early for the March 5th Minnesota primary, Super Tuesday, so that mil those in the military and overseas can vote. Uh, does that have any impact? And also, does it have any impact with all of these legal maneuverings with Trump? I think it has two major impacts. First, obviously, like you said, making sure veterans, uh, folks you know, abroad can vote. That's important. Make sure all Minnesotans' voices are heard. And then the second piece I think it is, is it actually allows campaigns to focus on those hard to get voters, right? If election day is just game day, it's really hard to make sure everybody turns out. But if you've got a couple weeks leading up and make sure that you can knock on doors with folks who maybe might not show up on election day and really try to drag them out to the polls. Well, let's talk about the Democrats. First of all, in New Hampshire, Dean Phillips, uh, congressman from the 3rd Congressional District, in the polls at least, really appears to be a footnote here. Um, single digits in the polls that I've seen. Uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a combination of two things. One, uh, Dean Phillips has very little name ID across the country. Um, and I think that's manifesting itself in New Hampshire. And then the second piece is I think a lot of Democrats are just making the, the, the practical calculation that Joe Biden is very likely going to be the Democratic nominee, and it's not providing much oxygen to other folks who are trying to challenge him. Well, President Joe Biden came out recently in the past couple of weeks with a ferocious attack on President Trump, directly naming him, which may not sound a bit like a big deal, but it was by far the most personal, most aggressive attack on Trump. Obviously, that shows a new tactic. Is this going to work uh, long term? Obviously. Uh, Biden's looking at the long game. Yeah, I think it's the right approach. I think for the past year or so, it's been really saying, look at these indicators in the economy. Things are doing well. Biden economics. The polling has shown that message hasn't resonated enough uh, in the polling. And so what I think the Biden campaign has to do is raise the stakes. Make this really about a contrast between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Make this about the democracy versus what we saw for the past four years of chaos with Donald Trump. You've got to raise the stakes, and I think you've seen that change in strategy with the Biden campaign. All right. Abu Amara, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. A couple of footnotes. The reason we didn't mention the Iowa Democratic caucuses is those results won't be out until Super Tuesday on March 5th. Another footnote, Minnesota Congressman Dean Phillips, who is giving up his congressional seat to run against President Biden, is polling 50 points behind the president in New Hampshire. After New Hampshire, it's on to the February 3rd primary in South Carolina. Talking points, of course, will be on top of it all. And don't forget to watch our full Iowa caucus coverage Monday online and on WCCO News. As for talking points, we stream every Wednesday and Thursday night at 6.30 and 9.30 p.m. By Friday evening, we'll post the entire show to our WCCO YouTube channel for on-demand viewing. Please reach out to me with any comments or suggestions. And thank you so much for watching. I'm Esme Murphy, WCCO News.